Hi, welcome to The Buzz. As the weather warms up, so does the wildlife activity. Our preserves are full of slithering snakes and crawling turtles. And I'll show you why I love snakes so much and give you tips on how to help those turtles cross busy roads. Plus, stick around, we'll check in on our furry, fuzzy, and maybe sometimes a little awkward wildlife babies. Get ready to have some all so cute moments on this episode of The Buzz. an unpopular opinion, but snakes are one of my favorites to find in the preserves. They're starting to reemerge from their winter homes, laying out on trails, open areas in the prairies, and logs at our ponds. In Illinois, we have about 40 species and 17 have been documented in Will County. They can always use some more positive PR, so let me be your guide to show you why they deserve our love and appreciation. Let me introduce you to my model today. This is Penny the ball python. She lives at Plum Creek Nature Center and is one of the education animals. And even though she's not native to the area, she's a great snake ambassador, helping visitors young and old conquer their fears of snakes. Right off the bat, snakes can be hard to relate to. They don't have arms, legs, external ears, even eyelids. Snakes are reptiles, and that means they're cold-blooded. So cold blood means they have to regulate their body temperature using the environment. So that's why you'll see snakes sunning on a blacktop uh, trail, try to get their bodies warm. And if it gets too warm, then they have to seek cover to cool down. Instead of fur, snakes and reptiles have scales. This protects their body like armor, but also helps them move and keep their moisture locked within. Her scales are nice and smooth, but other snakes may have rough edges called keeled scales, like our garter snakes and our northern water snakes. You'll notice that these scales come in lots of different colors, different patterns. They can be stripes, dots, bands, and so much more. A lot of times snakes in our area have muted tones of browns and tans that help them camouflage in their environment. All snakes shed their skin, starting from their head down to the tail, usually in one long piece like this. They'll rub against logs or rocks to help them get the skin off. This would be like if you had to get your sock off your foot without using your hands. You can tell a snake is ready to shed by their eyes. Penny here is about ready to shed. She's got these milky eyes, and that's a fluid that's separating the two layers of skin. Snakes shed their skin for a variety of reasons. Because they're growing, their scales are old or worn out, or it helps them get rid of parasites. Young snakes shed more often because they're growing more. But an average adult will shed about two to four times a year, depending on how much they eat. Snakes have teeth that are curved backwards, and that helps them grip and swallow prey. My favorite adaptation is their unhinged lower jaw. Our jaws are fixed meaning they can only open so wide. But a snake's jaw is like a rubber band, and it can stretch out to go around the prey and swallow it. Snakes can range from eating once a week to once a year. Remember that they're cold-blooded, and that's linked to their metabolism. So the cooler they are, the lower their metabolism is, and the less they need to eat. Also it depends on the species of snake, age, their last meal, and hunting strategy. Younger snakes will eat more because they're growing more, where our older snakes are starting to slow down. Snakes are carnivores, and they can only eat something as big as the widest part of their body. So you're not gonna see their last meal outlined in their bodies like the cartoons may depict. For the most part, snakes live solitary lives until it's mating time. In the spring or the fall, they'll come together with different species mating at different times. For garter snakes and northern water snakes, they can form these mating balls, which is when the males swarm the females, intertwining into kind of a snake party. We have found these snake parties here at Snapper Pond, and it does take visitors by surprise, but it's one of those things that you'll have trouble looking away from. I notice I take long glances trying to count how many snakes are actually at this party. After mating, snakes can be born in a few different ways, either hatching from eggs or live birth. They'll be born in the late summer or early fall. 
In the case of northern water snakes, they can have from 12 to 36 live babies. You can tell the moms apart pretty easily because they are ginormous when compared to the males. Out of the 40 snakes in Illinois, only four are venomous, including the eastern copperhead, northern cotton mouth, the timber rattlesnake, and the eastern massasauga, all of which are found in the southern part of the state. We get a lot of people thinking they've seen an eastern massasauga, but the last recorded individual was in 1999 and it was struck by a car. Since then, the Illinois Natural History Survey has conducted numerous surveys, but haven't found anything. So it's thought that in Will County, these snakes are extirpated or locally extinct. Unfortunately, a lot of times snakes get misidentified as being venomous. It breaks my heart when I find snakes that are clearly killed for the wrong reasons. Two common snakes that are misidentified are northern water snakes and fox snakes. Northern water snakes, also known as common water snakes, are very common along our waterways. They can be around two to four feet long and appear mostly dark, but if you look closely, you'll see reddish brown bands along their bodies. So it's a great day for snakes. You can see there's one right over my shoulder here. These are northern water snakes, and they can be found in a variety of aquatic habitats, like lakes, streams, rivers, ponds, marshes, and they'll eat a variety of aquatic critters, like crayfish, frogs, turtles, even leeches. Plus, they'll venture on land to get birds, mice, and even other snakes. So I'm looking along the shoreline, plus in the shrubs, because, ooh, there was a frog, <laughs> because there could be hanging out in the branches right at eye level. And then this tree that's in the pond, ee, I see two that are just kind of laying intertwined way down there and they're kind of like pulsating a little bit. I don't think this is necessarily mating, but it could be just fighting for the best sunny spot. Snakes are for sure out. There is one that just keeps on crossing the trail, so we gotta make sure we watch our step. It is so cute though. I think I just love them because they don't have arms or legs. They're just kind of slithering around. Fox snakes can be found in open grasslands like farmlands or prairies. They can also be two to four feet long, but they have more of a blotchy black and brown dotted pattern. Their heads can be a brownish reddish color as well. Now they often get confused for rattlesnakes because they have an interesting defense mechanism. When they're threatened, their little tails will rattle. Even though their tails come to a point and there's no bony rattles, they can still make noise if they're in leaves or vegetation. I've been surprised by this as well, as I picked one up, felt and heard that rattle, and quickly dropped it. We're still learning about snakes. One snake, called the Kirtland snake, is shy, secretive, and threatened. There was a petition to try to get into the endangered species list, but just not enough was known about its population. So the district in the Illinois Natural History Survey teamed up to start surveying some of our preserves. These snakes can be small and secretive, so they can be a challenge to find. So we put down cover boards near crayfish burrows where they like to hang out. Once the researchers find one, they collect data. They'll take the measurements, see if it's a male or a female, and they'll put a tag on it. This tag helps identify the individual snake and helps monitor the population. We're gonna tag along with our wildlife ecologist, Becky, as she checks some of our cover boards. You'll never know what kind of snake she'll find. So we've got a Chicago garter snake here. And then this one is a fox snake all coiled up. Oh, here's the other. Oops, you're all right. Oh, fun. Um, <laughs> this is their primary defense, is to defecate. This one's doing quite a bit of it. Please don't touch me. It's too late. It's part of the job. So this one is a plains garter snake. Um, if you counted where this lateral yellow stripe is, it is three and four scales up from the belly scales, which is how you ID this species compared to a common garter snake. Sometimes I do measure them just for the data, um, but if I was going to do actual scientific, like in the literature, they always measure from snout to vent um, and then tail length. I don't get that specific. I just kind of 
want to know how long these snakes are for just general age guesstimations. I always set them next to the board so they can go under it if they want to or they can go away. So now I'm entering the data for each of the species that were under here. This was a three species board. We had the Chicago garter snake, which is a subspecies of the common garter snake. We had the plains garter snake, and then we had the fox snake, which is really exciting to have three different species cohabitating. Snakes benefit us and the ecosystem. They're considered meso predators, which means they're in the middle of the food chain. They eat smaller things and bigger things eat them. Plus, they're found in a variety of habitats, from forests to prairies to wetlands. So this means they not only benefit just one ecosystem, but many. They also keep our rodent population under control. A medium to large snake can eat nine pounds of rodents a year. That can fill up a king-size pillowcase. From being staples in the food chain to having some intriguing adaptations and mating ball parties, snakes deserve our love. And there's not any that are documented to be venomous in our area, so there's no need to fear from our slithering friends. If anything, they're gonna need our help. If you see a snake sunning on a busy bike trail, grab a stick and lightly push it off to a safer area. And don't forget to snap a picture to show your love to their family and friends. Do you want to do more to protect nature, inspire discovery, and connect people with the great outdoors? You can when you support the Nature Foundation of Will County. This nonprofit charity raises funds through support from donors, organizations, and the business community to help support the Forest Preserve District of Will County's mission. The foundation helps various initiatives take flight. It helps the Forest Preserve secure national touring exhibitions. It pays for new amenities such as campground welcome stations and bike repair stations on Will County's regional trails. It assists with the costs associated with land stewardship, which includes equipment for volunteer workdays and seeding of native plants to restore the land to its original state, which helps enhance not only your outdoor experiences, but local wildlife as well. There's a lot more work to be done, and we're just getting started. Roll with us on this adventure and become a champion for nature so future generations can appreciate and explore everything Mother Nature has to offer. Donate today at willcountynature.org. on the move. As the weather warms up, the turtles are on a mission to find new territory, new love, and new places to eat. Females have a crucial mission to succeed at. They are crossing the roads to find places to lay their eggs. And as we all know, turtles aren't the fastest animals. So slow that you may be thinking, is that a rock in the road? At this time of year, turtles are following their instincts, and a lot of times that involves them crossing the road to get to where they need to be roadway strikes can really affect the turtles' populations. In addition, turtles mature slowly and they have low reproductive success due to predators and other factors. So losing a few females to road strikes can really impact their population. Luckily, there are ways to help. Step one, your own safety is top priority. So make sure you pull over in a safe place, use your traffic signals, observe where the cars are, and your surroundings before going to the turtle. The second most important rule is to make sure you move the turtle in the direction that it's heading to. This may seem like a bad idea to you, but trust the turtle, it has its instincts and it knows where it's going. 
If you try to move the turtle to a different direction, it may just simply turn around and cross again. If you completely relocate a turtle to a new pond, it may struggle to survive trying to figure out where to eat or where to overwinter. A lot of animal welfare organizations are using an analogy that we can all relate to. If you saw a senior citizen crossing the road, you wouldn't just take that senior citizen into your car and move them to a new pond you think they would enjoy. So trust, turtles know where they're going. So best case scenario is to not touch the turtle at all. Try to get it to move on its own while stopping traffic. Keep going, you got it. Our model today is Paddlefoot. He's a red ear slider. And for other freshwater turtles like him, like our painted turtles, the best way to pick them up is to gently hold in the middle of their shell. Now be careful, their arms and legs can kick, so it can surprise people into dropping them. If you find a feisty turtle or just nervous about dropping it, another alternative is to grab one of your car mats from your car. Then you can place the turtle on it and then drag it across the road. Once you've crossed, remember, say it with me, move the turtle in the direction it was heading. For different turtle species, there's different ways to handle the turtles. Young Creed here is a snapping turtle, and they don't call them snapping for nothing. It has a long neck that can reach to either side of its shell. Uh, because its neck can go all the way back to the side of their shell, you wanna make sure you hold the back uh, with the tail in the middle, lift up and walk over. Creed here is very young and is pretty light, but when you find the snapping turtles, they can be 35 pounds, some have been reported 50, some even 100 pounds. So using that mat might be an easier method. Remember, no matter what kind of turtle it is, never hold a turtle by its tail. This can actually dislocate their spines. Lastly, never take a turtle home as a pet. This is another factor that affects their population survival rates. Remember, they're not lost. They're just on an epic journey. Last month, we talked about all the lovely love songs that were filling the preserves with music. Well, those birds have met their match and have been busy. Now it's baby season. Some are just being born, while others got a head start earlier this spring. But now is the time that we start seeing them more often in nests, wetlands, and even in your own yards. So let's take a look at what we can find, whether they're cute and fluffy, or maybe in their awkward stage. Birds are busy building nests right now. And depending on the species of bird, their nests can look different. They use different building materials, like the robin uses mud and grasses, whereas this hummingbird nest uses lichen, moss, and spider webs to keep it all together. American robin nests are pretty common in our backyards and neighborhoods. Their eggs are pretty easy to identify, being a classic sky blue color. They can lay three to five of them and incubate for two weeks, and they'll be in the nest for another two weeks. After a month of nest life, these birds become fledglings. This means they have a fresh coat of feathers and they're ready to try them out. So they might not be great at flying yet, you'll often find them on the ground. But don't worry, the parents are nearby ready to assist. If you like picnicking in one of our pavilions over the summer, you may notice some barn swallow activity. Like their name suggests, barn swallows don't need trees to nest, but they prefer ease, beams, and rafters of barn sheds, and yes, our picnic shelters. Both male and females construct a nest together using mud and different grass bits to make kind of a cup shape. They'll lay three to seven speckled white eggs. Once the eggs hatch, the parents are busy. Barn swallows will feed their babies insects caught in mid-air. You may see them around our mowers when we're working on an open area. They'll swoop down and catch any insects that get stirred up. Meanwhile, the robins are busy feeding their babies insects, worms, and berries. They'll feed them six times an hour, making 40 trips to the nest, and all said and done, it equals about a half pound of food per day. Not all birds start nesting at this time of year. For example, American goldfinches wait until the end of summer to take advantage of the fluff from milkweed and thistle to make their nest. 
On the flip side, birds of prey have already started nesting at the beginning of the year. So at this time, their birds are more grown to be fledglings and juveniles learning how to hunt. Like we just learned, there's lots of tasty eggs and young birds to choose from. Earlier this spring, we were lucky enough to find a great horned owl nest with two owlets. One was brave enough to start branching, which means its talons were strong enough to kind of hold on the branches and start walking out of the nest. After a week of this exercise, it will start making short flights around the nest. And in 10 weeks, it'll be a flying expert. Remember, nesting is a sensitive time for any animal. Most bird nests are federally protected with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and any human interference can cause them to abandon their nest. Our wetlands are a very important habitat for a variety of reasons. They help prevent flooding, they filter out pollutants, and they serve as a nursery for many different wildlife species. From amphibians to ducks to beavers, many animals take advantage of this healthy habitat as their home. Along with the bird songs we heard last month, we also heard some frog songs. Throughout the summer, different species will take their turn singing. Frogs go through a life cycle with many distinct stages. First, they start as jelly eggs, then they emerge as tadpoles with long tails, they'll eventually grow arms and legs, and finally end into transforming to an adult. Using my net, I caught all sorts of different kinds of animals, but I also found these leaves with jelly eggs on them. I'm not sure what species they are, but it gives you a good example of what this jelly egg actually looks like. This is a green frog tadpole. Uh, in the ponds that I scooped, there's bullfrogs, but they're much bigger. And American toads have so, like they're so tiny compared to this. The green frog tadpoles have a lot of speckling. And all tadpoles have a mouth under their bodies to kind of scoop up food like a vacuum. These green frog tadpoles hatch three to seven days after the eggs were laid. But what's important is that it actually takes them three to maybe 22 months before they transform into adults. Since green frogs haven't even begun singing their songs yet, this means that these tadpoles are from last season. So this could be the year that they change into adults. Insects are another animal that goes through a life cycle. Butterflies may get all the credit, but dragonflies and damselflies transform as well. As adults, we imagine them flying around in the wetlands and the prairies, but they all start in the water. Females will lay their eggs in ponds, streams, swamps, wetlands, and the babies will hatch and will continue their growth in the water. So here we're looking at the dragonfly larva is the bigger one and a damselfly larva, which is the smaller one, which kind of matches their adult forms. Dragonflies are tend to be a little bit bulkier than damselflies. They're still insects. You can tell by they have six legs and they have three body parts and they can breathe out of their butts. So the damselfly has external gills, one, two, three, to help breathe. And the dragonfly larva kind of has this little straw sticking out that they can get air from. The dragonfly or damselfly larva will molt their skin to grow. Depending on the species, they could molt eight to 16 times. That final molt is where they will be transformed and emerged as adults. This too can take time. Some species can do it within a year, but others will spend their time in the water four to six years until they're ready. Meanwhile, they are fierce predators. They have these scoop-like jaws that can catch all sorts of different kinds of baby insects, including mosquito larvae. And of course, we can't forget our fluffy mammal babies. They have different strategies. Some like rodents will have lots of babies all year long, while others like deer will have a few babies just once a year. Eastern cottontail rabbits are very common in our neighborhoods and are famous for their prolific breeding ability. Their gestation period is short, only a month long, so they can have multiple litters throughout the year. Their breeding season runs long from February to September, with the peak being March through May. Rabbits can make a nest really anywhere in your yard, even right here in the middle. They dig a small hole and then cover it with grass, leaves, and plant matter. So it'll look like kind of a dead spot in your yard. They'll use the nest for about a month long. So to avoid any unnecessary accidents, check your yard before you mow. And if you find one, just mow around it. You may get concerned because you never see a mom visit the nest, but don't worry, they only visit two times a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And this is on purpose. They don't wanna draw predators to the nest. 
One of our Will County Wildlife Facebook members was lucky enough to catch red fox babies in his own yard. The foxes will spend a month in their dens before venturing out on their own. The babies, also called kits, start with a gray-brown color, then transition into more of a sandy color, and by summer, they'll grow a red coat to match their parents. A litter can be from two to up to 12 babies. At the beginning, the mother does most of the care, but later on, the father will go and hunt and bring food back to the family. By five months, the fox babies are kind of on their way out, playing in the yards, but sticking close by the parents. By fall, they'll be on their own. Wildlife babies may seem like they need our help, but they really don't. Nature is purposeful. A lot of the times, the parents are nearby just waiting for you to leave to make a move. If you see clearly an injured baby or a dead parent, then that's okay to intervene. But remember, the Forest Preserve District of Will County doesn't have the right permits or equipment to help in these cases. Instead, you need to take them to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. You can find a complete list of ones in your area by going to wildlifeillinois.org. The next generation of wildlife is gearing up to grow up. From the treetops to the wetlands to the underground dens, animals are busy building homes and feeding young. If you want to help baby wildlife, make a safe habitat in your own yard. Put up birdhouses and plant native plants. Keep an eye out for those underground dens and give them space. Let nature do its thing. Will County residents, these preserves are for you. All 24,000 beautiful acres. It's your tax dollars that support us. So reap the benefits by enjoying the great outdoors right in your own backyard. If you've never visited a Will County Forest Preserve, what are you waiting for? They are all welcoming places for everyone of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. With 130 miles of trails, there's plenty to explore. Hike with a friend, cruise on your bike, and enjoy the scenic views. Stop by a visitor center or take to the water at one of our premier lakes. It's our goal to bring people and nature together and we're committed to striving toward access for all. If recreation isn't your thing, don't worry, we have you covered with a variety of nature education programs for all ages. The forest preserves are for you, so join us and map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org. From snakes that need our love, to the babies that need their space, and the turtles that need a little boost of speed, our preserves are full of life right now. So get to your local preserve to see what you can find. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find trail information and to learn how to coexist with wildlife that may get a little too close to home. I hope to see you out observing your favorite animal, the snake. But until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.